Jonathan for reading our scriptural text on this morning, which came from the book of 1 Corinthians. The chapter was 1, and the verses were 14 through 17. And it is from that passage of scripture that I would like to draw upon the blackboards of your minds and preach from the subject, How Misunderstanding Causes Division. How Misunderstanding Causes Division. I don't know about you, but whenever I'm having Bible studies with individuals or just simply sharing a track with somebody and we are doing just fine, but once we get to the point of obedience to the gospel, it appears that many in the religious world, they only know two verses. The first verse they know is John 3, 16. And after you adequately explain that verse to them, the next verse they want to drop is, but what about 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17? You're saying that baptism is essential to salvation, but if that's the case, then why 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17? On occasion, we would get that question on the radio program. On occasion, even as many of the Christians here are out evangelizing, someone may pull me aside and say, I was doing great, but then somebody dropped this verse, and I didn't know how to quite answer it, and so... What say you? How do you explain that to somebody? Well, I, I know it's not a contradiction, but what is the apostle saying here? Even here in Tucson, there are many men that have radio programs, and it seems like that everybody wants to be a scholar on 1 Corinthians. And so they take a moment that they're going to explain the book of 1 Corinthians to the congregation where they preach and they skip over all the things that talk about division because then they have to deal with the fact as to why they are the leaders and participants in that division that Paul says we shouldn't have. But for some reason, they decide that when they get to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, they're going to do three to four broadcasts on just that one verse. And they don't pull over on the side of the road and keep the car running. No, they slam on brakes in the middle of the intersection and they turn the car off and they're going to decide that we need to spend a lot of time and how people and Christians like ourselves and how the apostles and how the first century Christians were wrong when they talk about baptism, that clearly we're not understanding something correctly. Like, we don't forget how to read. And so... How misunderstanding causes division. I want us to take a look at three things as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 14 through 17. We're going to begin with verse 10 because I believe it's very important that we deal with three things as we look at this text. The first thing is the context. When people decide to lift 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17 out of its context, it becomes a pretext, and a pretext can prove whatever you want it to prove. And so we need to look first at the context. And then I'm going to talk about the cover-up. Yes, they are complicit in a cover-up whenever they try to use this verse to explain away the plain teachings of Jesus Christ. And then number three, I want to talk about the correctness. What does this text really say? What is it that we're supposed to teach when we teach this text? And so first, let's start with the context. The context, my brothers and sisters, when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 14 through 17, that context begins in verse 10, and the context is division in the local church. That's the context. Paul says what he says in verse 17, concluding a discussion about division in the local church. See, after the apostle Paul gives his greeting. To the brethren in Corinth and expresses gratitude to the Father because of these Christians, he begins to address the problem of division found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 17. First, let's look at verse 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, the Bible makes clear that there were the disagreements among the brethren there. Therefore, what does the Apostle Paul do? He appeals to them by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ to agree. 
as Christians, we will have disagreements. You know, we will have disagreements from time to time. You can be a twin raised in the same house by the same parents, the same identical way. But you are a completely different person than the person that you shared a womb with. And therefore, because you are different in that way, there are going to be disagreements. Yes, we all obey the same gospel. We all believe in the same God. We all agreed to come here at 945 this morning. We are all singing the same songs under the same eldership, worshiping in the same building. But just because we are the same in all of these things, we are all different. And because we are different, there are going to be some disagreements. And the reason why we're going to have these disagreements is because we all have preferences. However, we know that these disagreements, uh, we do know, however, that there can be no disagreements when it comes to what thus saith the Lord. We have to agree on what Jesus has said. We have to agree on what Jesus has done. We have to agree on the things that are written in the scriptures. Now, it appears by the way the Apostle Paul phrases 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, that these disagreements may have resulted in less than brotherly conduct. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves that we are brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus whenever our disagreements are beginning to get out of hand. He says to them, brothers, brothers, you shouldn't be talking to each other this way. Why? Because you're brothers. Your family. Yes, there may be disagreement, but there's ways by which you carry it out. You have to be civil with one another in these discussions. And so for this reason, Paul reminds them in this text that they are brothers. There were divisions among them. These divisions came about as a result of their disagreements. They allowed their disagreements to divide them. Therefore, he commands by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ to be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. And so there were disagreements, there were divisions, and because they never dealt with these disagreements and dealt with these divisions, it led to what we see in verse 11, that there were quarreling among them. This was reported to the Apostle Paul by Chloe's people. That means that somebody within that local congregation decided to write the apostle and tell them that we are having problems in the church. Please provide some words of instruction as to how we are to deal with these things. And so I don't know about you, but I thank God for concerned sisters in the body of Christ, for the body of Christ, and not critical sisters who are busybodies. And yes, there is a difference. There there are a lot of busybodies that will go around and tell whatever they want to tell and say all kinds of things and not even be concerned as to how their emails, their text messages, and their phone calls are crippling the church. But that wasn't the case with Chloe's people. She's saying the church is already crippled. The church is already hurting. There's too much fighting. There's too much division. There's too much disagreement. And so we need a word from the Lord as to what we need to do to fix what is broken. That brings us to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. The apostle Paul explains to preacher writers that has infected the local church. That means that they have allowed preachers and their love for preachers and their unhealthy respect for preachers to bring about such quarreling divisions and disagreements among them. And you know what? It's okay to appreciate a preacher. God knows that I appreciate the three of y'all that appreciate me here in this room. (laughs) But it's okay to appreciate someone that was willing to leave a nine to five and dedicate themselves to the preaching of the gospel. 
but it is wrong to be addicted to a preacher. I mean, there's some people in this room that still haven't given me a shot because you're still addicted to Craig. You don't have to say amen. I know I'm telling you the truth. And then some of you haven't even really given Craig a shot when he was here because y'all was addicted to Brent. And some people didn't give Brent a shot because they was addicted to Frank. And some people didn't give Frank a shot because they were addicted to the man before Frank. But see, that's what happens when you get wrapped up in preacheritis that don't nobody know truth except for the man I like. Don't nobody know their Bible. No one is a scholar in the scriptures except for the man I like, the one I want to listen to. And we see that preacher writers has infected the congregation in Corinth. I mean, some claim to be followers of Paul. Listen to how silly that sounds. I'm a man who needs Jesus, but I'm following another man. It makes you want to cry out like Alice when you hear stuff like that. You know, that a man following another man that needs Jesus just like you need Jesus. And so some claim to be followers of Paul, maybe because he was the apostle who first brought the gospel to them. And we read about that in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 11. And then some within this group claim to be followers of Apollos. Maybe because after Paul's departure, he was their next preacher. Apollos was a man that Luke said in Luke, uh, Acts chapter 18, verse 24 through 25, that he was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. We see that Paul planted, but Apollos has the work of watering, and it is possible that the church was impressed with Apollo's scholarship and pedagogy and therefore said, forget this Paul guy, I'm going to follow Apollo's. But then even within this same group, some claim to be followers of Cephas, who was the apostle Peter. And maybe because it was Cephas who actually walked with Jesus from the beginning and was given the keys of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, thus opening the doors of salvation to both Jews and Gentiles in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10. So people say, well, we need to go back to the very first apostles. I'm a follower of Peter. But then in this same group, some claim to be followers of Christ. Maybe because Christ is the head of the church, and the Savior of the body, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. And I appreciate those that gave Christ as the answer of their discipleship and their fellowship, because this is a group of Christians who understand that Jesus not only died for them, but also died for Paul, died for Apollos, and died for Peter. So that brings us to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 13. What we see in this verse is that Paul asks a series of questions to help them understand where our allegiance should be. He asks three questions, and it would be wise for us to answer and ask these same three questions whenever we feel like abandoning Jesus Christ for another way. The first question is, is Christ divided? And the obvious answer is no. Therefore, we shouldn't be divided among ourselves. The second question he asked was, was Paul crucified for you? The obvious answer is no. Therefore, Paul and no other man has paid the divine cost to be our eternal boss, but Jesus did according to Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. He asked the third question. That third question was, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Were you baptized by Paul's authority? And the obvious answer again is no. These individuals believed in the Lord, 
and they were baptized because of what the Lord instructed, according to Acts chapter 18, verse 8. Hence, it was by the Lord's authority and no one else's as to why these souls were baptized. That brings us to our scriptural text, beginning with verse 14 and 15, when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Because now understanding the mindset of many of the Corinthians, Paul begins to share and is actually glad that he did not serve as the baptizer for them, except for Crispus and Gaius. And this is because the brethren in Corinth were actually placing more emphasis on the person who dipped them in the water and the preacher who taught them than the actual message they obeyed and the Lord who bought them. Amen. That's a problem. Amen. When we put more emphasis on the man in the pulpit, we put more emphasis on the eloquence of speech, we put more emphasis on the person who dipped you in water than we do Jesus himself. That's a problem. That brings us to verse 16 where Paul also acknowledges that he baptized the household of Stephanus as well. But he is not too sure as to beyond these three individuals in their household, who else he baptized. Oh, to be so busy evangelizing and effective in conversion that we can't even remember who we brought to the Lord and who we may have baptized along the way because we're so busy doing the work and getting results and being so effective at it that we can't even remember all the people we have impacted in our lives. I hope to get to that point one day in my faith that somebody can come along and say, yes, back in 1995, I heard you and you changed my life for the better and I would say okay I'm just going to have to take your word for it I can't remember and so that brings us now to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 17 in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 17 Paul concludes this part of the letter by stating for Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel and not with words of eloquent wisdom lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. This is the verse that is misapplied and has caused division among the religious world today. And the reason why it has been misapplied is because people are complicit in the cover-up. So that's the context. Now let's talk about the cover-up. The cover-up is to deceive humanity regarding the essentiality of water baptism. There's three things that I want to bring to your attention as we deal with this cover-up. Number one, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17 does not nullify the need for water baptism, but speaks to the need of it. For apparently everybody in the Corinthian church was baptized. Yes, we see that when we look at Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. But even after Paul left, people were still coming to Christ and they knew to come to Christ, they needed to be baptized. You want to know how I know that? Take a look at your Bible as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and the verses 13, listen to your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and the verses 13, the Bible reads, For in one spirit some of y'all were baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Is that what your Bible say? Oh, that's good, because my Bible didn't say that either. It says, for in one spirit, we were all. We were all. That means this letter is going to people who have met this qualification. For we were all baptized into one body. Also emphasizing how silly division is. You came by the same spirit, baptized into one body. How are you all of a sudden okay with being divided? He said, for we were all 
baptized into one body. And the reason we know that this is water baptism is because of the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul is speaking about an act that is actually done by a man. And a man cannot baptize you in the Holy Spirit. But a man can baptize you in water. And so we see that it's essential. This verse doesn't nullify it, but actually adds to the need for it. Which now, our second point, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, addresses the need, the gospel, the priority need, the very essential need. The gospel is essential and must be preached first. It must be preached first. For without it, no one is baptized. See, God has always been a God of order. See, Christians mess up when we place so much emphasis on baptism that we exclude the elementary and the essential parts of the gospel. The fact that Jesus died. The fact that they in sin. The fact that, that Jesus didn't stay dead, but he got up from the grave. The fact that he had to go to the cross, the fact that God sent his son to die specifically for them, the fact that through Jesus' blood, the new covenant has been established. We tend to forget about those facts because we immediately want to run to baptism, and then we wonder why people come here in the middle of the night, get immersed in water, and you'll never see them. We got names in the directory of people you ain't never met. And why is that? Because we place so much emphasis. You need to be baptized. You need to be baptized. All right, fine. If I get baptized, will you stop talking to me? Not understanding that there is a message that is supposed to lead them to the product of immersion, which will keep them stable even after they have dried off. And so this is what Paul is talking about. He is talking about the need of the gospel. And when you get the gospel right, when you preach Jesus and him crucified, then you can't preach Jesus without baptism and people will never question it if you explain the gospel right. Listen to what Jesus says in his great commission. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. Jesus says, go into all the world and baptize everybody you see. That ain't what he said, is it? He said, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And when you have done that, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. So their belief and their baptism were the results of the gospel that was proclaimed. And then he says, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So notice what Jesus is saying, and then we're going to wrap that up with what Paul said. Number one, Jesus says the very first thing you need to do is proclaim the gospel. Just proclaim the gospel. Those that believe the gospel, number two, which was proclaimed and are baptized according to the proclamation of the gospel,